Hello, I'm Natasha. Welcome to my studio. Hi friends, it's Marie at Living Felt and today we have a special treat for you. So grab your backpack, get your passport because we are going across the pond to the UK to visit with our friend Natasha Smart of Natasha Smart Textiles and tour her felting studio. This is going to be such a fun visit because we are going to get to tour an active felting and fiber art studio. It is a rather small space that is beautifully designed and optimized for storage, inspiring display, working as an artist, and also hosting workshops and guests. Natasha is going to let us look at a variety of storage solutions that she's come up with to keep her space clean and clear of clutter and ready for creating at any moment. Natasha, thanks so much for having us and letting us visit you in your studio and your hometown. Uh, well, it's lovely to have you and lovely to be asked. So thank you for having me. <laughs> well, we thought we just couldn't wait until we see you again. So we thought it would be a good excuse to come visit you. And your studio is so inspiring every time we see it on Instagram, uh, your social. So uh, thanks for letting oh, us come yeah. in. Yeah, We're really sharing ideas on how people set up their creative space to keep their creativity flowing and make things accessible and organized and your space is so fantastic for that. So I think we're going to start by looking at your yarn storage. Uh, this is my very favorite thing in my whole studio actually that we've started with. It's actually, I've always used uh, boot clay, mohair boot clay wool yarns. So that's really been my thing for, for quite a number of years. So I've amassed a lifetime collection of it. And, um, and I just love it so much. It's my favourite thing to work with. And so when we uh, got this studio organised, which was sort of three or four years ago now, and I just didn't know what to do other than to keep all my yarns in boxes. I just wasn't sure how, how else to do it. And then I think I must have been browsing somewhere, I can't even remember now, and I saw some handmade wooden spice racks on Etsy from, a, from somewhere, somewhere in the UK, and they would do custom orders. And so I just suddenly had this idea of creating a couple of storage units, because I had a bit of wall space to use, um, and using these spice racks, and they, I actually measured lots of my yarns to see um, what sort of a size I needed um, to fill. And I asked this company to custom make the spice racks for me. So I actually got in an extra set of, or an extra shelf within it. And, uh, and I just love it. It's, I watch it and stand and look at it as I'm creating. And I find it, it really sort of helps me uh, and inspires me. Love seeing the textures out and the colors out right there on display. Yeah, yeah it's yeah, beautiful. Totally. Very clever too. Very clever. <laughs> because I run workshops here, so we always need sample examples of bags and baskets and lampshades and bowls. So um, I always have lots of things in the studio for people to look at and examples. So I have all sorts of bits and pieces hanging around in the studio. So people seem to really enjoy it when they come in for workshops. And seeing this sort of array of colours and different textures and things. So uh, it's lovely having, having some space to, to have your own things out as well. Mm -hmm. Oh, and this is my dress that I made uh, when I did my foundation course in textiles. So that was back over 16 years ago now. And uh, that was my final course piece, it was a Nuno felted dress. And this is a spotlight on a very, very special item, which has joined my collection of beautiful treasures. 
That's so sweet. It's like we all look at the same moon and we drink from the same mugs. <laughs> Natasha, you had the opportunity to set your studio up from scratch. When you were planning it, what were some of the, your main goals that you wanted to achieve? I already had my tables and the tables are obviously crucial for, for wet felting. So I'd had these quite a long time. And so that was my starting point, I suppose. I wanted the tables in the center of the room and their kitchen worktop height. They're actually add-on kitchen tables from Ikea. So, so they're a really good height for, for standing and, and felting because I do stand and felt most of the time, if I'm honest. So the tables were sort of in the center and then in terms of storage, it was sort of building up um, the storage around the table space. Also, it's actually quite a narrow room. So it meant that on the kind of long sides, there actually isn't lots of space for, for deep storage. So I've got some shelves and I've got the my my special spice racks for my, my boot clay yarns, but they're all actually quite narrow bits of storage. So I couldn't have big storage along those, only only really at one end. The other thing, of course, that's really essential is water. So I really needed a sink area. So that was another sort of deal breaker. And again, it had to go at one of the ends because there wasn't any uh, enough room width wise um, in the studio to, to accommodate it. It's actually not very far away from our kitchen. So there's an outside tap on our kitchen wall, outside wall. So actually it's only, the water has only had to run across the garden. And this is the UK, so it's only a small garden. Yes. And um, so that just runs across underneath the garden, I believe. And uh, and then, then comes up in the studio. So actually that wasn't too, too much of a problem. I couldn't get hot water. And so that was a bit of an issue. So I've actually got a separate hot water storage heater, which is in one of the cupboards next to the sink. So I have hot and cold water. I just have to turn it on each time I want to use it. Oh, that's nice. That's really smart. Let's look at how you like to store your wool and show us around that a little bit. So in this big unit with all the sort of square, square fabric bins, that's mainly where I keep all my fiber. And although you can't tell what the sort of organization is there, I've got them in rows. So on this top row, I think that's all of my fin wool I've got there. And then that's fin wool as well, I think. And then the bottom, all the Corydale sliver. So the fin wool is a back fiber. And some of them I've bagged up into, into smaller amounts. And then the bottom row is all, all Corydale sliver. But you'll see that I'm having to almost force them shut in that unit because they're all so full to, to overflowing, really. I've got some lovely uh, living felt. That's MC1 uh, in there. I've also got, got Bergschaft in that bin as well and then in, in the next one along. So there is an organisation there. It's not specifically labelled, but I know where, where everything is. So. Right. But what I didn't share with you is the big zip up storage bags that I've also got in the house, which have got my overflow fiber in of all types. So there are probably another five big bags in the house, I think, which I'm trying to hide from Steve, my husband, so that he was not always sure where they are <laughs> or that they're there. Um, so yeah, so I think the moral of the story is you can never have enough, enough storage, really. Right. St <laughs> storage is key, I agree. And especially having it organized and tidy so that your space is still creatively open enough that you uh -huh. have room to think and express. Because sometimes That's spaces right. get so cluttered that it's hard to carve out creative space, but you've done a beautiful job of tucking everything away and being very orderly and tidy about it. And your studio was also designed to have guests, right? Because you do in-person workshops there in your space. Yes, so that was another consideration, obviously, with having the tables right in the center of the room and then needing to ensure there was enough space to be able to, to work easily all around. So my maximum number of people that I, I can accommodate really, students for classes, is four people. 
and right. four students and me and just enough space for me to sort of be going round and round the tables, seeing how everyone's doing throughout the day. Exactly. Well, that seems like a nice size group anyway. Intimate, sweet, friendly. Yeah. I get a lot of beginners, actually, people who've never felt it before, but are just inspired to come and, for instance, make a bag. So it's nice that I can give everybody quite a lot of individual attention. And, and I do often say to people, making a bag uh, as your first felt making project, this is quite ambitious. Mm. Um, you know, so it's, it's quite an achievement. So, uh, so yeah, it's helpful for me to be able to, uh, to give lots of, of sort of individual attention. And we get an opportunity to look a little more at Natasha's workspace. This is the studio all set up before a workshop. So the work, last workshop I did, I think, was to make felt baskets and for workshops to enable everybody to see what colours they can they can use. And I like to give people lots of choice so they can really totally bespoke and customise what they make. So I lay out all of the fibres and then... That's probably the trickiest bit of the day is when uh, everybody's choosing what colours they want to use. But once we've done that, then um, then I just get everyone to help me put them back into the bins and, and they're packed away until next time. That's smart. That's smart. Well, that's really kind of you to put out all of those fibres and choices for people to select from. Really fun opportunity for them to get to see all that eye candy in one place. So this is where I normally stand. Obviously, I've got my one of my many trusty felting balls and uh, this was the start of a, uh, a bag that I was making, a large bag. As I say, I, I usually stand up and uh, I'm actually standing opposite both the yarn storage display and our patio doors so I can see across to the house and into the garden as well. So it's a nice outlook and really, really sunny and light. I've got one, two, there's four windows in such a small space, actually, four windows. So it's, it's really lovely uh, and light, especially in the summer. That's fantastic. Yeah, your space definitely looks well lit. You've got the canned lighting and then all that sunlight coming in. It's fantastic. So under the tables, which is, again, why these tables are so brilliant, I've got numerous really large plastic containers, storage boxes, and that's where I keep all sorts of bits and pieces. So I've got my embellishment fibres. So I've got sort of I've got one one box which is for sparkly fibres because everyone loves a bit of sparkle, don't they? So things like merino blends with a bit of Angelina in those sorts of things. So the sparkly uh, box is uh, is the one on top. I've also got silk hankies I think in the in the bottom box. And of course, as time goes on, and you're constantly collecting up more and more embellishment fibres, aren't you? So everything is starting to, to sort of reach its limit. So I really should stop probably buying extra embellishments, but then developing your stash is all part of it, isn't it? It's part of the joy of the whole thing, I think. I concur. So I've got all my mohair boucle yarns on the wall. I've also got these three enormous bins, which are for straight uh, mohair, because I like to use a combination of different mohairs. And you can see that I've got these split up into colour sets. I've got green and blue in the first one, pinks and purples in the next one, and then reds, oranges and neutrals in the end. So people's eyes always light up when I bring these bins out and they then have to choose, choose even more colours because they think what I've got on the wall is, is all they've got to choose from. And then I bring these three bins out. So again, this is why we spend most of the first hour in workshops just choosing what colors everybody's going to use so but i do tell everyone this is my lifetime stash so it's uh it's a good 15 or 16 years old now uh, some of it that's fun and that's beautiful i i do the same thing i'd like to store by color families so that i can yeah isolate or hone in on what i need for that project but those are really fun yarn baskets i've got another box which is for my curly wool locks, probably a bit more random, everything in there, I think, <laughs> sort of in a colour organised way. But I really, I really enjoy working with the curly wool locks, so they're a lo lovely thing to have. So I really have tried wherever possible to use every inch of storage that I could, could find, uh, just to try and make the most of it. It's all got to go somewhere. 
<laughs> and the bins, I do the same. I have invested so much in those bins. I kind of added to it all over time. So I started with the bigger ones and I think I had them the other way around and then realized that actually, if I turned them around, I could fit in another one. So then I bought more. And then I realized, <laughs> oh, I had all that, that they did a really, narrow shallow one. Oh, that could fit on the floor so it sort of has developed over time i didn't start off with all of that but i think just as i've sort of needed more storage really i've then been looking for for different solutions so it's just grown right and it's nice when you find something that's repeatable because the uniformity can really help to yeah. add what feels like a visual organization to a space so this is another more recent addition where I realized I had this tiny width of space next to my big units. And you could also find these storage boxes which had these flat open fronts. And I thought, oh, I could have a, a, a stacking set along there. So that's what I've got sort of squeezed in right next to the, the big units. Things like pool noodle rollers, they can always be squeezed into a tiny bit of space. But these stacking stacking boxes are really helpful, as I say, because you can just pull the fronts down and then access what you need in there. So I, I keep in there things that um, I probably don't use quite so often. So this is one small, it's not a deep unit at all, next to my, all my wall storage. So I've got various things in there, like my lovely um, palm washboards. So I've got a few sizes of those. And there's all sorts of other bits and pieces in there. Um, I've got some open shelving there. You can see I've got scissors and tape measures, some rolling tools, lots of towels. I've got lots of towels in my studio. <laughs> this is a sink area. You can't see any biscuits, but there are many packets of biscuits hidden in the cupboard. <laughs> I really love my sink actually, which is a really nice deep big one. That's the water heater I was talking about lots of bottles of washing up liquid and my ball browsers. I've got some bubble wrap in here and pieces of thin plastic. And uh, I also keep things like felting balls and some specific bits of bubble wrap that I've got that are specific sizes for, for using with certain projects. So I keep all of those in a big box along with the, the tights uh, that are another essential bit. That's what you can see there. So I've got various different felting balls. You can see some of the really old living felt bright pink balls that you used to carry some years ago. So I've still got some of those, uh, which are still going strong. And I think it's probably been nearly 10 years now. My tables are great because they've all got drawers in as well. So there I've got lots of tights and some olive oil soap. So it would be lovely to, to keep all of my storage in, in one very neat, area of the studio but unfortunately because I am so limited to space um, as you've probably seen I've got tools and bits and pieces hidden away in all sorts of nooks and crannies everywhere so they're all around the studio in whatever space really I can find uh, so well you've done a brilliant job and you're storing for more than just yourself you're storing for your students as well so that's a lot to house yeah, and it looks organized and purposeful and like we could find what we needed if we were there by ourselves <laughs> rummaging around yeah. so we've been talking about storage so this is the ultimate cat storage <laughs> so this big tower that we've we've got for them and uh, they absolutely love it. There are so many beds within it. We've got four cats now, so, and they're always, generally, there'll be at least one or two of them lolling about in, in it. So it's not so strictly sweet. studio, cat storage. <laughs> <laughs> now, do the cats hang out in your studio with you when you're out there? They do in the summer. So I've got big patio doors on the studio, which face the, um, side of the living room which has also got French doors and so it, when it, the weather's warm we'll have the doors all the doors open and they can kind of wander in and out they generally don't in interfere with things too much so yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's one of the one of the real bonuses of having a separate studio space is that I can leave things out which I, I just couldn't leave any of this stuff out accessible in the house uh, as it would all turn into cat toys all right. Now, Natasha, do you keep a regular schedule for yourself working in your studio? How do you set that up for yourself? 
I try to, but I think it's very easy to get distracted by the cats often <laughs> and, uh, and, and other things that are going on. But what I've, because I'm, I'm currently working on my second book, mm -hmm. which is a, a, quite a, an enormous amount of work. So what I've been trying to do lately actually is to, in between workshops, try and sort of ring fence a set period of say three days out of one week where I know I've got to be in here doing a particular project and I'm really trying to to stick to that I might not get out here first thing in the morning as which is what I should be doing as there's often so many distractions that that stop me doing that but generally that's what I'm trying to do is sort of stick to a schedule of I've got a particular project on the go so I've got these set amount of days, so I'm going to go out there and, and try and do that. Um, so, yeah, I try trying to be organized. Well, you have such a great space to work. I'm sure once you get in there, it's almost hard to leave. Yeah, I, once I get going, actually, I can then be in here all day and particularly in the summer as well, working until quite late. And I'm quite happy to, to do it. It, once you got started, it, it's quite tricky in the colder weather to come out. Right. I've actually got a an electric heater, so I have to set set that going before I properly come out here. Just otherwise, it's absolutely freezing. Um, but in the summer, it's it's actually I, I find it a lot easier to to come straight out um, uh, when the weather's wet, lovely and it's bright and sunny and warm. Uh, okay, so this is one of our spare rooms, which I. I've obviously requisitioned as a as a craft room, and uh, there's there's one of my my little helpers there. That's Obi, and uh, he's enjoying a bit of sunshine there. Um, but my craft desk again, you'll see it's the same sort of plastic boxes, um, but lots of smaller ones. So I do anything I need to do on the on the laptop. Uh, at my craft desk. I also do make things there. I use my sewing machine there. And I've got all sorts of bits and pieces, more probably sewing related, um, which I keep there, sort of smaller, smaller items, um, bits of material as well, and different sort of notions and findings. Um, but yeah, I, I love it. It's it's such a great desk. There's so much storage in it. Oh, I love it. Yeah, so that. that's my indoor, indoor studio. I've got an indoor and an outdoor. Very nice. <laughs> I spend a lot of time in the utility room washing towels, so I thought that that deserved a mention. That's the before and after of the towel washing. Three loads of washing after a workshop generally is what I do, so that's a typical post-workshop amount so, of washing. Yeah. That's a really appealing space. You know, you, even if you yeah. needed to wet felt a little bit indoors or if somebody had a space like that, if they fixed up the utility room a little bit, they could work in a space like that because it's so bright and cheery and clean. Oh, totally. And in fact, before I was able to use this studio, because we'd already lived here for three, at least three years, three or four years when I didn't have this studio. So that's where I used to wet felt. That was my small space um, yeah. for, for wet felting. Was yeah, I like that room. Natasha, on your pieces, when you're working on your art, where do you draw your inspiration from? So I think a lot of it is about the natural world. I've always, since I was a little girl actually, I used to collect shells. So I've got a big shell collection. And we moved here to Exmouth back in 2015 because it's a, it's a coastal seaside town. We specifically moved here because we wanted to live by the, by the seaside. And we love going on holiday, places where we can go beach combing and, uh, and spend time doing that sort of thing. So I think the natural world and, and particularly sort of the seaside um, is, a, is a big inspiration. And although I don't generally make very obvious direct representational pieces in my artwork, I would say what, I, what I'm doing is probably focusing more on patterns and textures from nature, and particularly in shells and, and seascapes. And that tends to, I think, come out quite a bit in what, in what I do. 
So you can't help really, I think, but be inspired by, by beaches and, and shells and that sort of thing. So I think that's probably for me quite, quite a big thing. Yeah, I think we really do see it and you do it so colorfully and so well. It's a beautiful abstract that definitely has the essence of that coastal beachy feeling. Yeah, and I think we get to see some of that scenery. So yes, yeah, so this is my local beach. This is Exmouth Beach. It's actually a, a two mile long sandy beach. It's a really lovely stretch. And it's actually where the sea meets the estuary, which is coming down from a, from a river. So we're sort of in a bit of a, um, we've got a, a sort of 90 degree angle and the town is, has got estuary on one side meeting the sea the other side. So it's really lovely actually the beach. So you, you haven't just got the beach looking out to sea, you've got the beach, but you're also looking out onto uh, other bits of coast uh, of the coast going stretching in, the, in a different direction. So it's, it's quite a lovely aspect that we've got here. We're sort of in a bit of a, a corner, um, if you like. So it's uh, just a really, really pretty, pretty sort of outlook, particularly on the beach. And, and there's two miles of beach. So that changes as well. There's quite a lot, a lot of it. So what you can see there in the distance is the coastline, the other side of the estuary. And we're also, Exmouth marks the start of the Jurassic coast. And we had that, you might have seen that, it's called the Geo Needle. It's a, a big sort of monument. It represents the start of the Jurassic Coast, which goes all the way through to places like Lyme Regis, which is very famous for all the fossils, the dinosaur fossils that were found there. And you might have seen the, the cliffs are very, very red. Um, it's, a, it's quite a different bit of coast compared to further east in sort of Kent and Dover at the very sort of end of England where the cliffs are all white. You've got quite a lot of walks that you can go and do, which are all walking along, basically along the top of cliffs really, with amazing views as you, as you walk along. So yeah, um, that's yeah, beautiful. it is a lovely place to live. Yeah. And this is a shot from the actual beach. That's our lifeboat station. So that quite often gets called upon to, uh, to go and rescue people who have either got in trouble on boats or more often, I think, got in trouble on, on the cliffs and, and may need to be rescued. And we have beach huts. They're not quite the normal beach huts, which, which are sort of single you might have seen them in pictures of the UK beaches where you have a, a sort of single little, they're like little houses, aren't they? they these yeah. ones are slightly different. They're kind of joined together, but um, I believe that they, they seem to come and paint them every year and they've got this set, set of colours. So it's, uh, it's all very, very traditional British seaside, I think. Now, who rents? Do they rent or they own a beach hut? And what's the typical person to do that? Like, do you have one or is it people who live away? I don't know. I think um, in some areas, some coastal towns, people actually buy their beach huts. Here, the local council manages them and rents them out. So I think you can join the waiting list. Probably it's probably quite long, I would imagine. Um, but you can join a waiting list to, to have a beach hut. And then if somebody decides that they don't want to rent it anymore, then, then you, you might be lucky. Um, I suspect it's probably local people actually who maybe they we can actually walk to the beach in about 10 minutes so we we wouldn't really need a beach hut perhaps if you were a bit further out and you wanted to store store lots of supplies because I, I think they must have electricity in there so people are in there with their electric hobs and making cups of tea and and that sort of thing. So, and, and that's where they store their deck chairs. It's, it, it's a lovely idea. Um, yeah, I've never seen them here in the States, only in the UK. Uh, we'll haul everything, you know? <laughs> the, yeah, yeah. The thing to haul that, <laughs> I think it's so clever. And then I think we get to see a little bit of your town as well. So this is, a, a sort of 
stretch of town. Uh, it's called the Beacon, so it's it's high up. So the beach in this shot was to the left, and uh, okay. we're we're high, so we're sort of on the on the cliffs a bit. I think it's sort of Georgian architecture, so I believe that that those a lot of those properties would be listed properties where you know they're protected oh. um, from from too much development because they've they sort of got architectural um, sort of historical um, value. So that's a sort of very one of the older parts of town, I think. Mm-hmm. So quite interesting looking buildings. And this is the very centre of the town. This is called the Strand. It's sort of our central square. And we've got our war memorial in the centre. Uh, you can see the, the poppy display still on there. And this is quite a, a lovely space. There's lots of seating all around. And uh, again, not quite to the time of year yet, but lots of these buildings that you can see are cafes and restaurants. So they have seating outside. And it's a really lovely sort of European feel actually in the summer now. Uh, with all the once all the tables and chairs are out, and we've also got dinosaurs. <laughs> so, I was I was mentioning that that we're at the start of the Jurassic Coast. So this is a, a, a nod to that. We have uh, lots of dinosaur sculptures, which are sort of positioned around town. There are others around as well. Um, in various places, but th- that's those are the main ones. <laughs> that's fantastic. I bet the kids just love that, especially. Yeah, to see them. And, uh, and it looks like yeah, such a wonderful it, little town to walk and shop and have a tea or a coffee. Yeah, there are there are lots of places to go and eat eat scones with jam and cream and cups of tea. So all the all the traditional stuff. So we're very that's good at that fantastic. in Devon. It's fantastic. It's so lovely to see where you live and Aww. your creative studio space. Absolutely beautiful. Everything about it, just inspiring and Aww. yeah, lovely. Natasha, if you were going to choose like your top two to three things that you would like someone to have as they're beginning their little wet felting journey, what are a couple of those things? Well, obviously, I'm a big fan of the felting ball, so it would have to be a felting ball, definitely. So that would start you off. And then we need, we obviously need some fibre, so mm-hmm. some kind of bat fibre, then some embellishments. And I'm a big fan of mohair yarns, so I think maybe some some yarns, that would be lovely. That sounds perfect. So what we're, we're going to do is take a few of your choices, and we're going to be giving those away to people who comment. Oh, lovely. I look forward to that. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Natasha, thank you for letting us all come in from around the world to visit your beautiful space, meet your critters, (laughs) dig in your drawers, (laughs) see your town and your beautiful, inspiring environment. It's really been a treat to visit with you and get to see this first person. Have your tour. Oh, thank you. You're very welcome. It's always lovely to to share um, sort of my world with everybody and and what I do here and where I live. It's uh, that's really lovely. So uh, thank you for for having me as as always. A special treat. And for those of you who don't know Natasha, we mentioned earlier she teaches workshops in her studio, so you can reach out to her. We're going to pop up her website and social handles here, so you can look her up. But if you're not in her area, know that she has a fantastic course and another one coming on feltingtutorials.com. You can make these fabulous bags behind us. She teaches us the making a backpack over a ball and that's available in the school now. So it's a wonderful class and Natasha breaks it down into turning art into science so that you can have a repeatable process and a fantastic outcome. People are making great backs in your class, Natasha. Oh, they are. (laughs) I've been loving seeing backpacks that have been made, actually. Some really, really beautiful ones. Definitely. So y'all check it out and look for more on Natasha. We have another uh, interview with her and definitely check out her class. Her handle is Natasha Smart Textiles. Her website's Natasha Smart Textiles, and she also has a YouTube channel. So make sure to follow her wherever she is. Thanks for having us, Natasha. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Lovely to see you. I hope you enjoyed visiting my studio. See you again soon. Bye.
Hey y'all, be sure and check out Natasha Smart's classes on feltingtutorials.com. She has a wonderful class for wet felting these backpacks over a ball using the Living Felt Big Bertha Ball, and she breaks it all down for you step by step so that you can make your very own custom backpack. If you enjoyed this video and would like more inspiring ideas for setting up your own felting and fiber art studio, check out this video right here.